Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Connor, and I'm an educator with the St. Louis Zoo. Now, today we are talking about an ecosphere experience, and I want to kind of talk about what that is. But before we get started on that, let's talk about Zoom logistics. Now, I've been running a lot of the tech side of things for Zoom lately, so hopefully I'll catch everything. But um, first thing started, um, we do have a chat box. It's either in the top or the bottom of your screen on a black bar. Go ahead and find that now. It's a great way to communicate with me while we're, we're uh, speaking. If you have anything that you want to add into the conversation, I'd love to see it. Um, we also have a Q&A section. And that's where you can submit any questions that I'll be able to get to at the end of the program. So anything that is hopefully pretty relevant to what we're talking about, I'll try to set aside some time at the end to touch on all of that. Um, we do have a tech person behind the scenes um, and they will be monitoring the chat. So just keep in mind, you wanna be respectful to anybody else that's viewing. We're only gonna be here for about 20, 25 minutes. So if you guys are getting bored, go ahead and uh, just let everybody listen and don't take away from that short time that we have together. And at the very end, we will have a poll. Now we're gonna have three polls today. Um, the first one is going to be about what you think about bugs, but the last one will be what you think about us and what we're doing at the zoo. We'd love to get your feedback and how you, on how you enjoyed today's program. Um, so that helps us build and design our webinars better for the future. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and um, remind you about the community standards for the chat box. Now we are going to be able to talk to each other. We just want to remember to be respectful to one another and friendly. Again, we're only here for so long. So keep that in mind. Uh, we will use the Q&A box for the questions. <clears throat> and uh, keep in mind that if we do have continued problems, we may be removed from the webinar as well. So just touching on all of that before we start. Now our topic for today is an ecosphere. Now, an ecosphere is something you may have heard of before. It's typically a completely closed off ecosystem. And what that means, it's, it's kind of like an environment in a jar. It balances perfectly. It has things that um, will feed off of each other and support one another without completely depleting each other's energy. So a good example, a common one is a shrimp ecosphere. It's basically a, a sealed glass container with salt water, algae, and shrimp. So the algae can feed off of the sunlight hitting the glass and grow. The shrimp can feed off of the algae and feed, and the algae does not really get hurt too badly. So it's kind of a self-sustaining little balance. The algae is making oxygen, the shrimp are making carbon dioxide, and everybody's getting what they want from the other. Now today we are not making a sealed jar. I want to be very clear that this is going to be a temporary setup just for observation. So because of that, keep in mind, we are making the most natural habitat possible, but it's only gonna be used for, I would say a day, maybe two at the very most. Now that's mainly because we wanna stay respectful to wildlife. Now, if we are ever going out in the wild and gathering materials of any kind, there's a good chance there are living animals in those materials. Things like dirt and leaves tend to have a lot more animals on them than you think. So because of that, we wanna be conscious of how we're handling our materials, where we're getting them from, how we treat the area we get them from, and of course, where we return them. So when we're all done making our ecosphere, we will be putting all the materials we found back where we found them. So let's go over why we would wanna make an ecosphere. So this little ecosphere, or you could call it a bug viewing jar or an observation station, there's all kinds of names you can come up with it. This is really to help us learn what kind of animals we expect to find around our area. Now, it's easy to point out things like squirrels and birds and maybe a raccoon. Those are a little bit easier to spot than say something like an ant, right? But believe it or not, ants and other bugs and invertebrates make up 95% of all of the life on the planet. So there's quite a few of them. And believe it or not, they're actually pretty hard to miss. Now they are the smallest animals on the planet, but they are by far the most abundant. They have the largest numbers of any of the animals on the planet. So they are common. Um, quite a few of them that I expect for us to find around Missouri would be things like roly-polies and ants and earthworms and spiders and beetles, centipedes, millipedes. Now all of those are what we consider bugs. Now, there's not a good umbrella term for all of those animals together. So that's the term I'm gonna be using today is bugs. Now that umbrella is a lot of different organisms. So don't just think of um, one or two. When I say bugs, I'm really referring to 
invertebrates that we would find on land. Now, in case you don't know, an invertebrate is an animal without a backbone. So we, as humans, as mammals, we have a backbone going from our head all the way down to our hips on the back of our body. And that allows us to flex and wiggle and stand up straight and do all that movement stuff that mammals do. But the majority of the animals on this planet don't have backbones and they can still move around pretty well. I'll give you a quick example. So I do have an extra camera here today. And I'm going to go ahead and show you a close up of one of my guests today. Now, I always remind people that there's no reason to handle any animal that you don't want to, right? So if you don't want to pick up an animal, guess what? You don't have to. And I actually recommend that you don't. But this is an animal that might be familiar to some of us. This is a roly poly or an isopod or a wood louse. They have quite a few different little names, but they're all pretty much the same animal. And these are by far my favorite. There's a couple different reasons for that. Number one, they're not really bugs like we think of them. They're not insects or close relatives of any other bug of any kind. Oops, I'm gonna make sure I get him back in his little home here. Come on, your temporary house is waiting for you. <laughs> Another reason we wanna be careful when we're handling these animals, they are very small and fragile, so I'm trying to be as delicate as possible when returning them. <clears throat> now, a cool thing about roly-polies is they're not bugs. Like I was saying, they're actually closer related to crustaceans. So things like crabs and shrimp and lobster are closer relatives to roly-polies than things like beetles and grasshoppers and spiders. Um, now, because of that, they actually do have remaining gills. So when we're taking our samples of dirt, it's a good idea to remember that some of these animals might need some moisture to be able to breathe. Kind of a fun fact, I wouldn't normally think of an animal like a roly-poly needing water to be able to breathe, but it is a very important thing to know, especially if we have these animals in our ecosphere. Now that's one quick example of what we might find. I'll show you a little bit better view of the roly-polies in just a second. Um, now today I'm doing a demonstration. So the dirt I have is not completely fresh from outside. It's been sitting for a little while. I don't think there's much in it. Um, so because of that, I will not be wearing gloves. I have a, quite a few different tools here, um, and I know for a fact that the majority of everything I have here is perfectly clean. Now, when you go outside, what I recommend are two things. One, to follow nature etiquette rules. Now, what that means is when you are moving something in nature, you want to make sure you return it back to the way it was <clears throat> so that you can allow that space to be a future home, excuse me, a future home for more animals. So if you find whatever kind of animal, a couple of worms under a log, you wanna make sure you put that log exactly the way it was when you found it so that other worms and other animals can use that same log for their home. So that's a good little uh, reminder when we go outside. The other thing to remember is um, you will be can, um, gathering dirt and leaves, things are, materials that a lot of animals use as their home. As a result, it's a good idea to wear some garden gloves or maybe use a little hand shovel, or something like that to gather our materials. So before we move on any further, I should have mentioned this earlier, I'd love to start with our first poll. We do have a poll we're gonna ask you all about your comfort level with bugs. <clears throat> so go ahead, I think our poll should have popped up now. Now let us know. Now personally, I love bugs. You saw I was capable of having one in my hand, feel very comfortable um, handling certain bugs. There are still plenty of bugs I would not consider putting in my hand. So I would put myself at maybe the bugs are cool from a distance or maybe the I love bugs status, but everybody has different levels of comfort. I've seen it all. My main job at the zoo is actually to bring animals to schools where kids can interact with and touch those animals. So I totally understand not everybody wants to touch an animal. It's a very normal part of my job. I'm just curious to see what you all think. So let's go ahead and see if we have some results from this poll. Okay. All right, wow, a lot of us love bugs. I was actually not expecting this. Well, if you signed up for the Ecosphere uh, bug viewing webinar, chances are you had a little bit of a a liking to bugs already. So welcome. And anybody who is a little on the fence, just remember that we're going to be talking a lot about the importance of bugs. Um, 
and we're not recommending you pick up any. So today you don't have to worry about picking any up. I will do that part and hopefully we'll learn a lot about some cool bugs in our area. I should have mentioned this earlier as well. If you would like to put how many people are calling in today from your device and also what city you're calling in from, we would love to have that information just for our own knowledge. It's a kind of cool for us to know how far our webinars are reaching, how many people they're reaching and things like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and get us started on the materials we'll need. So this is going to be our ecosphere today and this is a pickle jar. Not super fancy, not super expensive. You actually don't need a lot of extra materials. Most of what you can use for this is stuff I use around the house. So I didn't go out and get anything super special today or uh, for today. Um, you could use a recycled container like this spinach box. Now this is completely clear. It's plastic and it is recyclable. So what I could do is I could use that as an observation bin and then clean it after I was done using it and still recycle it. So it's kind of like reusing and then recycling. It's a nice little uh, <clears throat> extra use that we get to, to do before we recycle it. So that's going to be our first step is a container of some sort. We're then going to need some dirt. Now I put mine in a Ziploc bag and that's because I don't want anything in the dirt to wander off into my apartment here and also because I want to keep it kind of dry. I want to keep it uh, well, excuse me, I want to keep it the same level of moisture, rather. So I don't want it to dry out anymore. I don't want it to moisten up anymore. Now, when you collect your dirt, again, you're going to want to use gloves, shovel, thing like that, uh, because you never know what's in that dirt that you're moving. Same with the leaves. So I do have some, some dried leaves in a bag here as well. And what I'm going to do is combine them all in my jar. Now, you can always add more moisture. I have a little spray bottle here. And this is just distilled water. It was sitting out for about 24 hours to evaporate many of the extra stuff in there. So pretty safe. If you could use um, reverse osmosis water or special filtered water, that'd probably be even safer. But for today's purposes, that's going to be just fine. Now, I can always add more moisture with that squirt bottle, but I can't take it away. So I want to make sure that I keep my eco jar as dry as possible until the end when I can then decide if these animals will need more moisture or less. So another good little tip here is I take a piece of paper just out of my printer and I can make a funnel. And that funnel is going to work great for keeping this dirt out of my carpet, which is always a nice thing that the grown-ups that might be helping you with this project would probably appreciate as well. I know my wife will. <clears throat> I'm going to make our handy dandy, very deluxe funnel here. And we're just going to start putting some dirt in. Now I'm not going to be super careful. Again, today is a demonstration purpose kind of activity. This is actually too big for my funnel here. So I'm just putting in some dry dirt here. This is actually very woody stuff. It's uh, kind of like ground up fiber from bark and things like that. So very dry. And again, I know there's not a lot of living things in this stuff. Now, again, when you're going outside, you're going to be, want to be careful when you're handling any dirt because you never know if there's a centipede or a spider hiding in there. And while those animals are not aggressive, they certainly don't like their homes disturbed. And I certainly wouldn't be um, <laughs> feeling very safe if I had a giant ripping apart my home, right? I'd probably defend myself too. So I can't blame any spider that would be hiding in our dirt for reacting. That's just what they do. Now that's why we always are careful and respectful of any materials that we gather, especially from outside. And again, why we want to return them to where we found them. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I got some chunks of dirt in here. Now I'm going to add some leaves. And this I am going to use the funnel for because I want to crumble my leaves. Now that's because those leaves will add a little air pocket uh, for animals to hide in. And also the, these leaves work great as food. So a lot of the animals that I expect us to see, like those roly polies or maybe snails or earthworms, they're what we call decomposers. Now what is a decomposer? Well, a decomposer is an animal that eats dead plant matter, like these dried leaves or maybe dead wood and they turn it into soil. Now, they don't have a magic wand where they just turn things into soil, right? Uh, we turn our food into stuff too. <laughs> I bet you can guess how. 
Now, every animal does that process. They eat their food and it comes out somewhere else, right? And it's kind of a gross topic. It's kind of a silly topic, but it's a very common topic, especially when you work with animals. So it's something that I don't get uh, too giggly about anymore <clears throat> because it is a natural process and it's important for the ecosystem. Now I'm gonna spray my leaves just a little bit and that's mainly because I know my dirt is very dry. Now you might not want to spray your leaves at this process, but I know I'm gonna add even more. Now a good pair of tweezers is a really helpful tool to have in this process. So we can mix up our dirt a little, here we go. Now again, I'm being pretty careful, but not as careful as I probably should be if I were gathering materials directly from outside. But again, I know that there's not anything in my mix here. So I have it mixed up pretty well. Let me spray it one more time. Okay. And if I could get my hand down there, I would mix it all up with my hands. <clears throat> but I can't, <laughs> so we're gonna call that okay. Now, if you look closely, you'll see the sides of my glass are all wet and foggy and kind of messed up. Now, a nice little tool you can use to fix that is a paper towel and just go along the inside edge like this, kind of like a big windshield wiper and just wipe it away and look at that. Already a huge improvement. There's still some stuff stuck on the glass, but Again, my hands are a little too big to reach in our jar, so. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to introduce a few more animals that I would expect to find in an ecosphere that you make at home. So let me go ahead and switch over to my smaller camera again. Hopefully you should be able to see that. Now inside of this container, I have a few snails. Now these are globe snails. They're very common in Missouri. Here's one that has its little head out, you might be able to see its eye stalks. Now snails are very unique animals. They are invertebrates, just like our roly polies and our worms and ants, uh, but they have a different kind of shell. It's not an, in, an exoskeleton like an insect grows. It is a mollusk shell, and that means it grows with them. They don't have to shed it off like uh, roly poly sheds their shell and things like that. Now I like these little guys because they are pretty. I think their shells are very beautiful. Um, they're very slow moving, obviously, but they are also decomposers. So that means they're going to eat some of these dead leaves. You saw I had a few of them packed in with some dead leaves already. Now I'm going to go ahead and very gently carry my small snail and lower them in my container. There we go. I want to make sure I don't drop anything really hard. I want to be very fragile and delicate with all of the animals we're working with here. Because again, they are smaller than us. You never want to handle a small animal too rough. Okay, so I pulled out a few of our snails. Now, I also have a special treat for my snails today. Again, because these are demonstration actor snails, they deserve a little treat. So you might notice that little piece of carrot there. That's going to be a safe food for my snails just for today. Now, <clears throat> my recommendation for our ecosphere is not to add anything to it that the animals wouldn't find in the wild. But today I have a little piece of carrot just to hold them over and make sure they're getting fed because I've been holding them a little bit longer than, uh, than you normally would. <clears throat> Another thing we wanna add are our roly polies. I started mentioning these earlier a little bit. Let's go ahead and zoom in on our camera here. We can see quite a few of them in here. Now these are just one of the species of roly polies we can find in Missouri. There are, Gosh, so many that I've seen personally. I don't actually know off the top of my head how many you can find, but I will say there's got to be over 10 because I have found four or five in one eco jar um, sample at a time. So very, very interesting animals. Again, they, they do need water to breathe. So they're a little special like that. Let's go ahead and this is just dirt I'm adding in here. Ooh, this is a good time for my funnel, isn't it? Whoops. <laughs> Yes, so minimal mess, especially for the grown-ups that are watching. This is a process that we can do without making a mess if we're careful. Here we go. Now, I might have buried my snails just a teeny bit here, so I'm going to shake that around. There they are. Yeah, and now snails can dig very well. This is loose soil, so if I put a little dirt on them, it's okay. They'll get themselves out, especially once they smell that carrot again. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add my roly-polies. And I'm going to do that in the safest way I know how. 
by putting them in this little cup first, like this. And I want to, again, make sure I don't drop anything very hard as I'm handling them. So, oops, one more. There we go. Very gentle and very slow. You can see I have quite a few little roly polies I set aside um, ahead of time for today. Okay. <laughs> I love these little creatures. Um, they're so unique. They just look different, right? Because they are crustaceans. They're not bugs like we typically expect to see. So let's let them walk in real gentle. Now they have, I believe, seven pairs of legs, which is quite different from the three pairs of legs we typically see in insects. There we go. Very gentle. Little taps to slide them. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So we have some roly polies, some snails. Now there's one more very important decomposer that I would expect all of us to find, especially if we're scooping things like um, leaves and dirt, and that is worms. Now we mentioned earthworms earlier. Earthworms are another one that a lot of people don't like to handle, and I can't blame them. Some people, the more legs, the scarier the animal. Some people, the fewer legs, the scarier the animal. It just kind of depends. But with earthworms, I love to remind people that, that they are completely harmless. There are no teeth or claws or even jaws to munch with if they wanted to. Um, what worms do to chew their food is they actually swallow teeny tiny grains of sand or little tiny pebbles and rocks, and they kind of wiggle their bodies to use those as teeth to grind their food. So a similar practice is in birds, they swallow stones to help grind up the seeds in their belly after they've swallowed them because birds can't chew either. So um, <clears throat> worms have that little gizzard stones, what they call it, um, that allows them to chew in that same way. Now I'm gonna go ahead and, my worms are a little sleepy today. Now I'm not gonna rile them up and get them wiggly, but I do want to show you all that these are some pretty small worms. Um, these are not gonna get much bigger than they are. Now there are a couple different earthworms in Missouri and these are some of the smallest. Now the largest are the Canadian night crawlers. And believe it or not, they can get over a foot long. They are humongous. And a lot of people, when they see them, they assume that they're snakes. They're not snakes, they are earthworms and they are harmless. So even though they could get really big, all they ever do is eat dirt and poop it out. Just like we were talking earlier, decomposers, they eat all of the dead plants and they poop out soil. Um, so fertilizer, food for new plants. So we call those castings, and we actually give those castings away to classes around St. Louis to help them with community gardens. Those castings are a perfect fertilizer to help a lot of plants grow. So now that we've added our worms in here, I'm just going to add my final touches. I'm going to give us another little windshield wiper swipe here to make it look nice and pretty. Because uh, again, I'm showing off today, right? I have to make it pretty to demonstrate for you all. Now yours might be a jar of mud and dirt and that is okay. As long as you're seeing some live animals, it is serving its purpose. Now the last thing I want to add are decorations. Now I don't usually add a ton of decorations to my things, but there are some that are very special to me. So I'm going to show you just a few things I'm adding in here. Now a lot of people don't know that Missouri is a great place to find ocean fossils. Yes, that's right, landlocked Missouri. You can find all kinds of fossils from the ocean. Now this little pattern you might notice right here is from an animal. Now go ahead and tell me in the chat, what kind of animal do you think that pattern right there could be from? Now when I first saw, saw this, I thought maybe a fish fin or a bird feather, something kind of odd like that. Now the animal this is from is actually a sea fan. So an animal that's still around today and it is a coral. So on the coral reef, <clears throat> uh, we do have sea fans and corals are animals. They're not plants, even though they look a lot like them. So we do have an animal fossil here and I'm gonna go ahead and add that in our jar very gently so I don't drop it on anybody's head. There we go, okay. And we're going to add another one of my favorite fossils ever. Now this one doesn't look like much, but this is from a crinoid. Crinoids are close relatives of starfish and sand dollars, and crinoids have a big column of discs. 
So imagine a bunch of CDs um, stacked on top of each other. And that's what each of these little lines are. So if you take <clears throat> this rock, you can see these are the individual disc imprints, just like little CDs, little circles. And you know that these are fossils because they are perfect circles. Rocks don't form in perfect circles. So these must be from a living creature. So I love crinoids especially. I have this beautiful little polished amethyst stone I found in Missouri um, and polished when I was a little guy. Here's a top part of a crinoid. So this would be the part that looks more like the starfish. Those little lines are kind of the legs. And the last thing I'm gonna add is a piece of a crawdad claw. So here is a crawdad is like a crayfish. It's, well, they are the same thing. <laughs> it's kind of like a miniature lobster. So this little claw is from another invertebrate and this hard shell is its exoskeleton. Now I'm seeing a few messages that say we can't see the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and just bring things up to this camera to make sure everybody sees what I'm talking about. So this is the crinoid column I was talking about, those little tiny discs stack on top of each other. And that works like that backbone, even though they don't have one. This is the top flowery part. My beautiful amethyst rock. I love purples, one of my favorite colors. So I'm gonna add that of course, and our crawdad claw. Now that crawdad claw is made of chitin. And if you've never heard of chitin, believe it or not, you have it too. Chitin is the thing that makes up our hair and our fingernails. It allows um, our body to protect certain parts of our body. Uh, and that's true with animals' shells as well. So most of the exoskeletons that we see on bugs are made of chitin. Now what's special is my roly polies I have in here today can actually munch on that chitin, they can eat it and then they'll use it for their own shell. So what they're doing is they're chewing up the shell of another animal and putting it towards their own shell when they grow. So it's kind of like a weird recycling practice that I wouldn't recommend us try, but it's certainly unique and very useful when you're a bug and you're around a lot of other bugs. Because what they can then do is use other bugs shed skin to help them grow their own skin. So again, a very interesting kind of taboo process, but very unique and very helpful for these animals. Now I'm gonna give us a little opportunity to look over what we have so far. Now, if you can't see the phone video, I will try to do another, oops, <laughs> another view where I bring us up close to the camera, but let's just go ahead and use this phone at first. And I'll give us another chance to look without the phone. And you can see, our little crawdad claw. Now those roly polies will munch on that claw and help them grow their shell. You can see our fossil. Now let me know if you can see any animals in here. And again, if we can't see the phone, that's okay. We'll take a second. <clears throat> now I'm starting to see those roly polies and worms are tunneling down in the dirt already. <clears throat> so let's bring this a little closer so other people can see. Now, an important thing to remember about a lot of these animals is they live underground. So chances are when we bring them out of the ground and they see sunlight, they want to dig again. They don't wanna be out and about and exposed where they think the predators can see them. So we can see our roly polies are wandering a little bit right here. We have one on our fossil. Good, okay, we see some of them. Now there is a little worm next to our white rock right here. I don't know if we can see them, but they are quickly finding their way down into the dirt where they'll make their home. <clears throat> now remember, we did say something special about our roly polies, right? They need a little bit of moisture to be able to breathe because they have gills. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of moisture. We did some of this during our process, so I'm not gonna add a lot. What I recommend, now again, this is temporary, so it's only for a day or two, but even so, it is possible to add too much moisture. So what I recommend is only misting one side of the container. That way the animals can choose if they wanna be on the wet side or the dry side, rather than having the entire container be too dry or too wet. So we'll do this. Just spray on the front side here. That'll even wash some of the dirt off like a windshield wiper again. Wonderful. Okay, so that is pretty much our final product. Now you can add whatever you want to it. Um, I have extra snail shells I was gonna add. I even have some live moss that sometimes can be really pretty and a nice hiding spot for a lot of these animals. 
Now, the only guidelines I'd like to give you are to remember to respect these animals, to be as gentle as possible. Um, if you are gonna use tweezers, try not to use them to pick up the animals. They are very precise tools. However, it's very easy to pinch just a little too hard. And unfortunately, when you're working with animals this small, one pinch can be a little too much. So we're gonna be very careful with the animals. And remember, we're being very respectful to their native habitat. So that means we're trying to replicate it the best we can, but we're also trying to keep it um, pristine as best as we can. So wherever you got your materials from, you're gonna return all of this stuff back to that area so that these animals and the animals living in that area can continue to have those food sources and all of the different hidey holes that they would like to live in. Okay, well, I'm so glad you all were able to join me today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask our second poll now. Now, after we've talked a little bit about the decomposers and how many animals are out there that are invertebrates, now what are our thoughts on bugs? Now, some of those answers are slightly different, but the same basic idea. Oh man, and I'm looking through our Q&A and I'm so excited because I mentioned earlier, questions are one of my favorite parts of this job and we have some awesome ones. Okay, so I would love to see that poll whenever we're finishing up and I'll go ahead and answer our first question. Can we use wood for this? Absolutely. In fact, I recommend using some kind of bark or dried petrified wood. I have some driftwood here and it feels like styrofoam. It's very lightweight. Now it's not going to um, add a ton of nutrition necessarily, but what it will do is give a great hiding spot. Oh man, okay, I see a lot of good responses in the poll. Still not a fan, maybe learning some more could help me um, be less comfortable. I love when people recognize that answer. There are plenty of animals we're not comfortable with and that is fine. Sometimes learning a little bit more about them would help us appreciate them more. So especially for me, knowing the important job that some of these bugs play really helps me appreciate and respect them. Now a centipede is not an animal I would like to pick up, but knowing that they are bug predators, they keep some of the pest bug populations down, makes me respect them even from a distance. <laughs> okay, now the next question is, what is your favorite bug? Oh man, I'm gonna have to say roly polies. They're so cute, they're so cool, and they're just a great animal to use as a demonstration. They're harmless, um, anybody can handle them as long as they know how to do it carefully. But again, I recommend be very cautious, especially with the wild ones. Uh, we wanna make sure we're very gentle with them, not flipping them over very hard or anything like that. But I would say roly polies are probably my favorite bug with um, maybe earthworms as a close second, I would say. Okay, now where can we find snails? That's a great question. Now snails love moisture. So I know, especially because I have snails in here right now, that I wanna keep this nice and moist. Typically I find snails under rotting wood um, where there's a lot of moss and algae to munch on. They do like to eat root vegetables as well. So again, that carrot was a good choice, um, but typically they'll be eating something underground, a root of some kind. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Go after a rain, especially if you want to find snails. Roly polies do lay eggs. Um, that is actually a really fun fact about them. That's one of my favorite parts about them. So roly polies have a special pouch on their belly where they hold onto their eggs, kind of like a kangaroo. <laughs> so they hold onto their eggs and their babies on their belly for the first week or two until the babies get large enough to wander off from their mom and kind of be on their own. So an interesting little parenting fact that we don't always think of with bugs, but again, crustaceans are slightly different and uh, roly polies are just a cute exception in general, I think. Okay, we have, <clears throat> what is my favorite animal? Ooh, now I would probably have to say a polar bear, but that answer changes depending on the day. How many roly polies are at the St. Louis Zoo? Hundreds, we have one exhibit with pill bugs in it and I've counted three or four different subspecies in there, and there are tons and tons of roly polies that we uh, see in that exhibit at any given time. Should you put a lid on the jar to keep the roly polies from escaping? Yes, you should, Alicia. Thank you so much for that reminder. So <laughs> my last step, I definitely want to remind everybody, especially if we have grown-ups who are not super comfortable with having a jar full of dirt and bugs in the house, is to put a lid on it. Now, I would not put this mason jar lid on my container. Now, why is that? 
because all the animals in here need air to breathe. Even the earthworms, the roly polies, the snails, they all need to breathe air. So if this is airtight sealed, they will run out of air eventually. So what I do is I take a little chunk of cheesecloth or you can take a mesh or a screen of some kind and then I just rubber band it on the top. And that will keep any um, small fly uh, animals or, or any, I guess, crawly small animals. So spiders, ants, fruit flies, they will all stay contained because these holes are very, very small in the lid. So that's my recommendation. Now, if you don't have cheesecloth, you can absolutely use this lid, but I would poke a few holes in there or try to tape a screen or something of the sort um, over the top. That would be my recommendation. Um, thank you for that reminder because a lid is a very important part when we are containing animals. <clears throat> okay, so we have two more questions I'll get to. How many types of roly polies are there in the US? Now, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I know there are at least 25, but roly poly keeping is now a common hobby. So there are actually plenty of people that breed different species of roly polies at home um, in big jars like this, or maybe in big containers. And everybody who has them finds a new species every couple of days. So there's just tons and tons of them growing. That number is constantly changing and people are breeding them in captivity to make new breeds as well. Kind of like dogs and cats, it's crazy. So some people really, really love bugs. I'll go ahead and answer this poll for today if you would like. Um, to let us know how we did, how much you enjoyed this program. It's really helpful for our benefit for planning new programs. And I wanna go ahead and thank everybody for coming today. Now, it's been a long time since I've had a chance to teach. So thank you all for coming. This was a wonderful opportunity to do one of my favorite hobbies um, for the zoo at my home using materials I had here. Very special um, to be here with you all. And I really appreciate you coming. Now, if you have any additional questions for us at the zoo, we will show a slide at the very end that gives you an email resource you can contact, or you can go to our website at any point um, to look for more information on the animals that we have posted there. Thank you all for coming um, again, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.